Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining this MJA webinar. Uh, this event is sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline Australia, PTY LTD through an unrestricted medical grant. Through this grant, the events are uh, host, uh, my employer, uh, AMCO, and its masthead, the Medical Journal of Australia, uh, maintain complete editorial control over the agenda, speaker selection and content. By the way, my name is Ben Dorr. I'm the head of publishing and uh, I work very closely with a team of editors on the MJA. I would now like to introduce uh, the editor in chief, uh, Nick Talley, uh, to take uh, control of the presentation and introduce the speakers. Thanks very much. So thank you, Ben, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here uh, this evening for this webinar. Uh, on COVID-19 and how to save lives early on. I wish to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all are meeting today and pay my respects and our respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging. Now we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating and the experience by clinicians around Australia has varied greatly. One could argue in recent uh, months, it's really been Victoria and New South Wales that have borne the brunt of COVID-19 cases. But clearly, uh, as uh, Australia opens up, it's likely clinicians are going to see cases all over the country, um, and uh, it's very important to understand best approaches to management, which is what will be being discussed tonight. But I want to particularly acknowledge all my colleagues, all our colleagues, who've been managing COVID cases uh, over the last uh, 18 months, and uh, your work has been spectacular, and thank you uh, for all you have done. Now, at Nepean Hospital, which uh, in the distant past, I was the foundation professor of medicine uh, for a period, at Nepean Hospital, they have deep expertise in managing COVID-19. They've managed more than 4,500 cases at the hospital. Really very uh, impressive numbers. Um, and it's very pleasing to have two of their expert frontline clinicians here tonight to talk about management issues and to present these as first cases and then a more general discussion. The first presenter is Associate Professor Lucy Morgan. She's a proud Newcastle graduate. She's a respiratory physician at Nepean Hospital and Concord Hospital. She's a director on the Lung Foundation Board and She's been a Q&A star. So Lucy, it's a great pleasure to have you. Welcome, and we're looking forward to uh, your case presentation and discussion, and then I'll introduce the second speaker subsequently. So Lucy, please go ahead. Thanks, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting. And actually, I feel quite emotional about um, being able to share some of these experiences. Um, uh, looking after patients uh, uh, at Nepean uh, uh, over the last uh, few months has been uh, very exciting, um, very, look, absolutely exhausting, exhilarating, um, uh, all of those things, and of course, pretty stressful. So I'm actually thrilled to be able to uh, share some of our experiences because lots of things that we've learned um, uh, will change the way I, I practice my craft. Um, just one disclosure that's relevant for this presentation, and that's that I've been um, on the advisory board for GSK, um, uh, it, particularly in, res uh, in relation to the development of the utility of Citrovimab, which we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, so um, thanks, Ben. Could you change the slide, please? Um, uh, this presentation is about Gail. Now, Gail is really a very typical patient uh, from in our community. Um, Gail's 62, um, and she was a, a happy and healthy, she thought, a working member of our community. Her presentation and the things that happened to Gail during her illness are very typical for patients uh, with COVID-19 and very typical for a case that presented during the busiest time of my, of my clinical life, without a doubt. We were getting 20 patients very sick every night. Um, and this was at a time when vaccination rates in New South Wales were around 70%, but that reminds us that more than 30% of the commu eligible community were still not vaccinated. So I've got a very brief story to set the scene uh, for the sorts of patients that we're talking about. 
So Gail had some comorbidity. You can see there, she was a very overweight woman. She worked in real estate. She had asthma, diabetes, reflux, and a high blood pressure. She was a smoker, and she's had previous blood clots in her legs and in her lungs. Um, she was unvaccinated at the time. Um, she wanted to be vaccinated. She was actually very anxious about catching COVID and the impact on her health, but she was dissuaded by her by other doctors because she had a history of blood clots. And you might remember that in early in the pandemic, in, there was a great anxiety about um, at the AstraZeneca vaccine and whether um, the blood clot risk was um, was particularly high. Her GP talked her out of having AstraZeneca. And while she was waiting to get her Pfizer vaccine, um, she caught COVID. So she tested PCR positive in the community. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, and presented to our hospital after having nine days of symptoms. She had headache and fever. She had diarrhea and vomiting. That was quite a significant prominent symptom for her. She became dizzy. She had a cough throughout the illness. And by, the, by day nine, she was breathless and she... She saw me on the telly. She knew that if you were breathless and dizzy, you should call an ambulance. And, um, and she came to our hospital. By the time she arrived, um, next slide, please, Ben. She really was looking and feeling pretty crook. She was dry. She was hypoxemic. She was breathing quite quickly. And she was only maintaining sats of 90% with four litres of nasal prong oxygen. So initially, her initial treatment um, was to roll her prone, to increase the humidity and the warmth of the oxygen that she was being delivered, um, and to give her some dexamethasone. So we, uh, next slide please, Ben. Um, we chose uh, this treatment, uh, uh, this initial treatment, using a recipe book that um, that we'd actually contributed to. So this is the uh, ACI Care of the Adult Patients with COVID-19 and Acute Inpatient Wards document. It's a model of care that was written with input from clinicians in New South Wales, and it's an evidence-based based on the living guidelines, which was uh, able to be updated on a daily basis. But it's a recipe book for how to care for patients based on their clinical scenario. So she was moderately unwell with COVID, hypoxemic, pretty dry, feeling pretty sick. She needed to be in hospital and, um, being, and she had an abnormal chest X-ray. Um, I'm sorry I've skipped over it, but if we go to the next slide, please, Ben, you can see that she's got diffuse airspace changes uh, on that chest X-ray. We don't need a snazzy CT scan to tell us that she's got uh, diffuse uh, lung parenchymal abnormalities. When we listened to her chest, there were crackles everywhere. You can also see that she's got quite an enlarged heart and you can't really see a left heart order clearly. She was very hypoxic by day 10. She was getting sicker and she needed increasing oxygen um, supplementation. She was still quite dry. And based on the living guidelines in that document, we gave her an, uh, an escalated medical therapy with remdesivir and baricitinib. We're gonna talk about those a little bit later. She needed extra respiratory support. She needed CPAP to keep her oxygenation up. Um, and in fact, then she deteriorated further on the ward and needed to go to intensive care. Next slide, please, Ben. Uh, when she was, um, um, sorry, we used another uh, ACI clinical practice guideline that was um, a, a recipe for how to increase her oxygen support. This is the sort of document, it's publicly available and other states, um, rather than reinventing wheels, might like to access these kind of documents. Poor Gail ended up in intensive care. She ended up intubated, and of course, that led to a, a long and fairly um, tumultuous um, period of time while she was in intensive care. We had trouble controlling her sugars. The dexamethasone made her sugar levels go haywire. She developed a delirium, a urinary tract infection, and sepsis. She had prolonged hypoxemia. She became very deconditioned. And she's, uh, she actually had an infarct while she was in ICU too, which I accidentally left off the slide. Gail's on a, a slow and rocky road to rehabilitation and, um, and, to back to, and back to baseline. It's been really tough uh, months, set of months for Gail. Um, 
Thanks, Nick. That That's the end of the brief case presentation. Um, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, next slide, please. So, Lucy, um, I guess uh, obviously the question is, what could have been done differently to have had a better outcome for this patient and for similar kinds of patients who uh, end up in hospital? And, uh, you know, what kind of interventions might have made a difference? So could you perhaps tell us about that? What, what would you have done if you could have jumped into the TARDIS, as you've shown here on <laughs> this slide? Next slide, please, Ben. Thanks. Um, yeah, look, uh, this is James, of course, uh, Doctor Who. And the great thing about that is I get to play Rose Tyler. So uh, the, the two of us, um, you know, companions in space, if we could have jumped back into the TARDIS and taken Gail back, I think there are several things that we could have done. Um, that would have that could have uh, altered uh, or altered her course. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Um, look, uh, COVID has three phases really: uh, a, a, an asymptomatic phase after infection, um, a stage two where the symptoms are relatively mild initially but become more severe, and then a third stage where things are really um, much much more severe from a, a respiratory point of view, where the patient is in a very highly hyperinflammatory phase. So if we go back to be Gail's illness before she became symptomatic, there was an opportunity to change the course of time. If she'd been vaccinated, we could have reduced her risk of developing severe COVID. It, you know, it's a, two doses of, of a good vaccine uh, would have been her, her suit of armour to protect her from severe illness from COVID. That was one opportunity. The second opportunity was to identify that Gail was at risk of severe disease, um, uh, uh, even if she was at risk of developing severe disease when she caught COVID. Um, so I think identifying the things about Gail's past history, particularly her obesity and her other chronic respiratory uh, illness, that did leave her at risk, at significant risk, um, for developing severe disease. So when she caught COVID, when she was positive, she was at particular, she was a, um, someone who would have particularly benefited from uh, early intervention with, um, with medical treatment before she became hypoxemic. So we're going to talk a lot more about that later in the in the night. Um, those are the those are the things that I think would, could really change the course of her illness and might not have had her at day 26 in intensive care. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Basically, that's what this slide talks about. The fact that she was she's not old. She's 62. She would that I would have considered that middle aged, um, but that she um, did have significant comorbidities particularly her obesity, which really does increase her risk for developing severe COVID illness. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Look, increasing age, smoking status and comorbidities, particularly things like COPD, chronic kidney disease, uh, diabetes and hypertension, all dramatically increase uh, um, the risk of developing severe disease requiring hospitalisation and lots of medical intervention and therefore the consequences of that. Um, so um, that's just quite a, a, an interesting thing to think. If we'd had our time again, we really would have pushed to get Gail vaccinated earlier uh, and given her some early intervention treatment. Um, next slide, please, Ben. I think we, we might just move on and... Uh, um, and to my next slide, which is really the lessons that I think uh, we learnt, I learnt from Gail, um, is that we, you know, we should vaccinate everybody we possibly can while we've got time, because COVID moves faster than any policy in any government. Um, it's too late to vaccinate your community once the tidal wave of uh, of a Delta variant, for example, is already in your community. It's really worthwhile being able to identify those who are at risk of doing badly when they catch COVID, such as Gail, who had obesity, had hypertension, was a smoker, had reflux, had diabetes, all of those things that we, we know predict for bad outcomes. Um, that there are uh, treatments that are effective if they're used early, and we're going to talk about that a bit more. And that severe COVID illness is a very big problem for the unvaccinated. Uh, and it's going to continue to be. Even when we have very high rates of vaccination, like 
in New South Wales at the moment, there's still 10% of our community unvaccinated. That's still a lot of people at risk of developing severe COVID illness. Lucy, Thanks. thank you very much. That was a lovely presentation. And I guess it reminds me as well, it's very important people get boosters too, don't you think, in terms of the third dose? Um, and that's going to be critical as well to control of the pandemic. What are your thoughts on that, just very, very briefly? I think boosters are, uh, are likely to become um, a part of our future, but I think um, absolutely bedding down those first two doses is a real priority that I think we should uh, not lose sight of. Um, vaccinating everybody with two doses um, is important, and then I think it's likely that in the future we will all be boosted I think, plausibly on an annual basis. Well, we'll have to wait and see how often, hopefully not on an annual basis, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. But I think the boosters will, will really matter. Thank you, Lucy. I'm going to move on to our second speaker uh, from the PN Hospital. Very great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor James Branley. Uh, James is a Sydney Uni graduate. He's an infectious diseases physician and microbiologist. He's head of the Department of Infectious Diseases and Microbiology at Nepean Hospital, and he has deep expertise in COVID-19. And we're very pleased, James, to have you, and I look forward to you presenting a case and your views on early treatment approaches. Thanks, Nick, and thank you. Thank you to the organisers uh, very much for the uh, for the invitation. And uh, thank you to my good friend Lucy Morgan for comparing me to David Tennant. <laughs> I might point out that uh, follicularly I'm a little bit different to David, uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate the compliment. So thank you, Lucy. Um, just a slight uh, change in direction to tell you about uh, our experience um, from a very practical point of view running an inpatient service that's uh, integral with a HIFS service uh, that does virtual care in the community. And uh, perhaps to dis discuss a little bit about our experience running uh, a citrovimab clinic, because we've managed to um, uh, deliver now over 150 doses of uh, uh, citrovimab early in disease. So um, we have some experience in that uh, in that area and uh, we can talk a little bit about that as we go along. Ben, uh, uh, slide 18, please. So first of all, I'd like to just present a, a, a real vignette. It's not a not a case, but just, uh, just a, a particular um, individual that uh, highlights some points that I think are worth uh, raising. So case J is a 23-year-old man who has had juvenile uh, type 1 diabetes. He's really challenged from a housing point of view and, uh, and social point of view. In fact, uh, he was homeless prior to his admission uh, to the mental health unit and really has significant mental health and substance abuse problems uh, requiring him to be uh, an inpatient. He was unvaccinated. Um, Unfortunately, he acquired COVID-19 as a mental health inpatient. And I think one of the things I'd like to highlight is nosocomial transmission of COVID and the importance of that and the opportunities for intervention with, uh, with nosocomial transmission. He um, fairly typically, and very much like Lucy's case scale, deteriorated about day 10, and day 10 is often uh, a crisis point in COVID. Um, he then went to intensive care. Next slide, Ben, please. Slide 19 should be the x-ray slide. Um, he went to intensive care and required intubation. Um, he was commenced on dexamethasone and tocilizumab, um, and he had a prolonged stay in intensive care with prolonged ventilation and went on to develop um, probably a strep pneumoniae-related empyema which required drainage uh, before a long a long recovery period and then discharge back to his uh, somewhat tenuous um, living arrangements. Um, next slide, Ben. Uh, so I think the lessons we, we learned from Case J is that, firstly, young people can also become very unwell. And we remember with the Alpha variant that there was very heavy um, old age predominance in cases, but with, with Delta, 
we're certainly seeing a lot of young cases. And if there are risk factors in young patients, they can really do very badly and end up in trouble. So we need to assess the previral risks. And in this case, it's type 1 diabetes. But it's compounded in this man by social disadvantage, substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, and I think it does highlight that, um, that nosocomial infection is particularly important. It's particularly important to try and prevent it, but the reality of preventing transmission of a highly infectious virus with the number of people that, that come in and out of our institutions, whether they be hospitals or nursing homes or disability group homes, is important. This man also highlights that secondary bacterial infection, and particularly in young people, streptomoniae, can really be a, a, a life-threatening uh, life problem. So next slide, please. I'm just going to um, motor through this a little bit, and I'll ask uh, Professor Talley to ask some questions at the end. Uh, unless you want to interrupt me at any stage, Nick, please feel free to. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, an issue that Lucy alluded to. 90% vaccination is fantastic, and New South Wales is busily patting ourselves on the back. But 10% of our population is a significant number of people. And we are going to continue to see people who are not vaccinated or are partially vaccinated. And the obvious one in our society, we, we have children under 12 who are not vaccinated, and we're already seeing this quite commonly in New South Wales, that our cases uh, at the moment are often related to children, uh, and children spend a lot of time with their, their parents, and their parents acquire, um, acquire COVID, and then potentially many of these parents work in health institutes and bring bring the virus back into hospitals and other settings. So children are worth thinking about and we, we really applaud the efforts to hasten vaccination for, for children uh, in a safe fashion. I, I guess the other lesson we've learned over the past couple of months is the importance of identifying pregnant women. And these are a group that really have been under vaccinated until recently. Luckily, the, the, the uptake has been very good. But even when uh, New South Wales was at 80%, Amongst our pregnant women, the vaccination rate was still about 60%. I've highlighted disadvantage and, um, and mental health and substance abuse uh, with the case. Um, and I won't say any more on that except to say we also surveyed uh, some of our DNA patients and our mental health patients at a time when the state vaccination rates were about 75%. And the vaccination rates in those groups was 45 or less. So somewhere between 30 and 45% when the state was, was 75. So that's really important to be aware that there are elements of society that, uh, that get left behind in, in the sweep to vaccination. And our indigenous population are really worth remembering in this setting because many uh, rural indigenous populations have vaccine rates of about 50% at the moment. So um, they still are an important group. I've also listed their residential aged care, and uh, we've been involved in multiple um, uh, transmissions in residential aged care, and it's a really challenging space. But even if you have 90% of residential aged care vaccinated, you still have an unvaccinated group in that population, and you may find that the vaccine response in the elderly and the malnourished uh, can sometimes be less than perfect. Next slide, please, Ben. So this leads us to the idea about some other uh, vaccine blind spots, uh, particularly the immunosuppressed you know, patients and the patients we do see in hospital or, or who are in the community, but are being treated with heavy immunosuppression. Currently, I've got a patient on the ward who has myeloma and he's getting, you know, he's had significant immunosuppressive treatments for myeloma. And he's out beyond 21 days uh, in his COVID course and is still got a very high viral load and is still potentially transmitting and is not out of the out of the woods yet. So these patients are, are really important. Our dialysis and our chemotherapy patients and our malignancy patients um, 
are particularly uh, worth thinking about in terms of the under-vaccinated uh, population. Slide 24, please, Ben. Um, Lucy showed this slide, and it's really important to remember this. The, the last couple of years when we've been treating COVID, we've really been focusing on the red section of this, which is the inflammatory response when people get sick and die and come into hospital. So hospitalised care is to the right of this slide, but it's a, it's a, a story in two parts. The first week is really an area that we haven't been intervening very much and we need to be intervening much more aggressively and much more, you know, with a lot better tools than we've had up till now. And we're going to go on to talk about some of the tools available for intervening in this um, in this viral response phase. Um, now, we see that middle part, uh, which is often when a patient is being hospitalised and that's an opportunity for intervention, but it's probably too late for a lot of the viral interventions. So what we have to do is attack the virus earlier, and that poses some challenges. Next slide, please. I um, like to think about um, therapy for COVID in terms of the five antis. Uh, so if we think about what we've been doing the past past year or so, it's the bottom, the bottom three. We've been treating hospitalised patients with anti-inflammatories. When they get bacterial infection, we treat them with antibiotics. When they get a clot or a pulmonary embolus, we treat them with anticoagulants. But there are two other anti antis that we need to consider, and that's what we're now up to in, in our thinking. The first is antivirals, and the second is antibodies. So um, we now have available in Australia um, uh, antibody treatment, and we have had for some time remdesivir, which I'll go on to talk a little bit. Uh, so remdesivir is an antiviral. Next slide, please, Ben. So early intervention really um, uh, poses some challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenge is early diagnosis and reducing delays in the information transfer between the laboratory and the clinicians who are treating the patient. And often public health are very useful in the, in the link uh, between the lab and the clinicians. We need to then get on and do a risk assessment. Lucy's talked extensively about the risks involved and we need to identify those risks. But, but simplistically, anyone who's obese, anyone who's pregnant, anyone who's got a medical condition, they're at risk. Um, we need to think about monitoring, particularly those risk patients. And the most important thing to monitor is their oxygen saturation. And there, thankfully, there are these tiny little digital monitors that are available. And combined with that, there are a whole raft of apps and risk rating schemes that are coming through the pipeline to assist clinicians in assessing risk and determining who's going to get into trouble with this with this disease. And then that leads us to intervention. Next slide, please. Actually, I'll skip uh, slide 27. Uh, go to slide 28, the next slide. Um, this is just a summary slide of the, the hospital treatments that are available on the living guidelines. And the, the national living guidelines are very useful and they're updated uh, as a living guideline, which uh, means that it's really worth uh, checking in on these guidelines uh, whenever possible. Um, so there's conditional approval for three of these uh, drugs and, uh, uh, and, and sorry, conditional recommendation and a recommendation for, for steroids, which is not really argued with. But I guess we have two anti-inflammatories there, tocilizumab, maricitinib, and we have one antiviral, remdesivir. So next slide, please, Ben. If we go on to early treatment of, um, of COVID, remdesivir is an RNA polymerase inhibitor, which um, has been shown to reduce the length of illness. So it hasn't been shown to have a mortality benefit. And like most antivirals, it would probably work really well if you gave it early in, in COVID. That's when your antivirals work best. But uh, because of a variety of circumstances, we're limited to using remdesivir when a patient comes into hospital and requires oxygen. Um, recently, citrovimab, which is our first available monoclonal antibody, um, has been released. And 
so Travimab has between 79 and 85 percent reduction in hospitalisation and death. So really quite uh, quite spectacular figures. There's also uh, RegenCov, which um, has now been approved, I believe, by the TGA and uh, and is um, uh, hopefully going to be available soon. But its exact place is still a little uncertain. It may have a treatment role. It may have a prophylactic role because one of the interesting things about it is it's got the ability to be given subcutaneously if need be. And then I guess the the bottom of this slide is what everyone's been waiting for. Um, and that's um, the oral agents that will push treatment of COVID very squarely back into primary care. Um, and Molnupiravir and Paxlovid are the two that have been released with some data behind them. And there is some very impressive data on these. I just would highlight, though, that the studies, the, the real world experience and the studies don't always match up. The real world experience, uh, it's quite difficult to treat patients early. Um, and uh, you know these studies, patients were treated at either in the first five days or or with Paxlovid in the first three days, and that that may not be easily achievable in the real world. And so the figures are probably the best they're going to be, rather than uh, rather than less. Um, so Nick, um, I might uh, hand to you at this point. Thank you, James. That was a lovely presentation and very comprehensive. There's lots of details people may want to ask about. And by the way, to the audience, please ask your questions in the chat. Please, any questions you have that you'd like to ask uh, or comments you'd like to make, please put them in the chat and we'll try and get to them. Uh, so we'd appreciate that. Uh, so please do so. So, James, I guess I'm a clinician. I'm a G. Let's say I'm a GP. And, and I want to know, well, how early is early? I mean, like, what do I have to do? And then how do I set this up? How do I organise a patient to get a monoclonal antibody? I mean, that's not exactly a pill. <laughs> I, I can't just go there and write a prescription. What do I have to do? How do I set this up? And, and, and how should it be set up? What's your experience with that? Yeah, thanks, Nick. So late September when Citrovimab became available, this really posed a challenge for all of us in New South Wales. And I, I think uh, likewise in Victoria, I think they're doing great work with uh, with Citrovimab infusion now. But initially when you set this up, it is, it is quite challenging. Um, ben, can we have up uh, slide 30, please? So this is... Um, this is a slide just discussing models of care. And in actual fact, the, the answer is quite mundane. A lot of it is logistics. It's really organising your system so that your communication and your transport all work. Um, and I, I guess this slide is just listing some of the, some of the issues we need, to, we need to consider. So we really need to act very rapidly after diagnosis. We need to find patients who are positive and we need to get them to the appropriate treating clinician. Um, and that means developing good networks between your diagnostics. Uh, and obviously diagnostics is moving and we're now gonna have rat tests and things that are gonna be impacting on diagnostics, but it's really integrating your diagnostic and your clinical management uh, at the outset. One of the other challenges is, and, and look, I spent an hour on the phone the other day with uh, a 60-year-old woman who was borderline obese, didn't want to be vaccinated because she'd read a lot of stuff on the internet. And reading stuff on the internet is a real challenge to us as a medical profession because, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. And if you select stuff, you can find reasons not to have treatments. So this woman that I was talking to was was talking that she'd looked up Citrovimab and and found that there were all these problems with it on on the internet. The the largest of which being that you know she she'd read that it was a new drug and therefore it was untested and untrialed. But look, the counter argument to that is that the idea of giving antibodies to um, 
to a patient with a viral illness is, is a tried and true principle in infectious diseases. The idea of giving antivirals is tried and true, and we do this all the time for the herpes viruses with valacyclovir and famvir. Um, so information and consent of the patient is really important. I think having a good virtual care model, uh, particularly a virtual care model that can can follow the oxygenation of patients, particularly patients who are at risk, uh, amongst other observations. Um, and then the ability to um, identify a space where you can infuse um, this drug or other drugs like it uh, in, in a safe fashion. So patient safety needs to be um, uh, paramount. Um, the way we did that was we pivoted um, the already existing infusion centres. So um, we pivoted two of our existing services. Our hospital in the home became our um, our monitoring of patients and, and care of COVID in the community via virtual care. And our infusion centres that regularly, you know, administer monoclonal antibodies for multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease and whatever else, um, we pivoted our infusion centres to, to deal with uh, citrovimab. What you need to do in that setting, though, is bear in mind the safety of the public and the safety of the staff. So your staff need to be competent in PPE. You need to identify a red zone because, remember, these patients are going to be highly infectious in the first few days of their illness. So you need a red zone that the patients can come into where people are in PPE and you can manage their treatment in a safe fashion. You want to protect your staff. Your staff are always worried about COVID and they need to be confident with their PPE, confident with their ability to administer an infusion and also confident to deal with any side effects uh, of the infusion. And the, the major side effect described is, is anaphylaxis. So uh, your staff need to be anaphylaxis competent. So I guess they're the major issues, but then really mundanely transport. You know, you have a patient who's at home, they're in quarantine, and you've got to get them into an infusion centre. And whether it be, a, you know, a caravan in the, in the car park of Coles or wherever, you need to actually get them somewhere safe where you can give this infusion and you're not going to infect other people. And also um, bear in mind that the public health orders have been um, requiring these patients to stay at home. So we had to problem solve that issue. We felt it was best for the patients to self-drive to the infusion centre when they could. And the way we did that was we, when we requested a patient come in for citrovimab, we uh, sent them a text that they could show to the police. And surprisingly, many of them got pulled over by the police and asked what they were doing leaving quarantine. And they were able to show them this text and phone, and the police were able to phone that number back and talk to us directly to confirm that it was a bona fide uh, trip to a hospital when they were COVID positive. So they were, they were the issues that we problem solved around setting up uh, a citrovimab clinic. So is there uh, resources for others to be able to do this? I mean, presumably this is going to be important if COVID cases start to increase, which most experts feel will happen at some point. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, how well prepared do hospitals need to be uh, and how long does it take to set all this up, James? Um, you know, how complex is this to get organised? Well, I think within the hospital space, it's it's not as complex as it sounds. Um, most hospitals are giving monoclonals on a regular basis through an infusion centre. Most hospitals have out-of-hospital uh, care in some fashion. I think the secret is to harness the experience and the um, what you're already doing, so that uh, so that you can pivot to to doing citrovimab or doing COVID therapies as required. Um, I think that's the secret. I think doing it in primary care is not impossible, but I think the the um, uh, the need to set up something that's both safe and amenable in primary care, I think would have some challenges, but I, I 
I, I think primary care would be perfectly suited to the oral therapies that are coming down the line. Thank you. Lucy, would you like to comment or perhaps yeah, follow think, up? Thanks, Nick. I, I actually had um, a, a comment, and that was that I think the, the GP, the primary care physician, clinician has an incredibly important role actually as being a, an ambassador or a conduit to help uh, to get, help get patients to citrovimab or similar um, as early as possible. I'm just going to start with a tiny anecdote that I contacted a patient um, who um, was identified as being um, uh, in the early stages suitable for citrovimab, but they didn't have a relationship with me. They didn't know me from a bar of soap. And um, they thought I was a prank caller. I think they thought I was trying to get them to vote for some uh, somebody uh, in the federal elections or something. But they just did not believe me that I that I was ringing to say who I was and what they should do. Um, and uh, they rang their doctor, their GP, their trusted clinician. They would have trusted me if they'd known me, I hope, but they didn't know me. They rang their GP who actually did did know me and said she's she's for real, she's not a fake doctor, and actually and we got the patient in. But so I think that that if the GPs know that so there's two things that they if they knew. If they knew that those of their, their patients who were at risk and if they'd had an opportunity to have a conversation, probably during the time of having a conversation about vaccination. If you're not completely vaccinated and you catch COVID, make sure you tell me, ring me, or or make contact with somebody because you, if you are incompletely vaccinated, you would be suitable to get this early treatment. And it's a real thing. I know about it. I believe in it. So if you catch COVID, let me know so you can get it in time. That kind of conversation could be incredibly important to getting access, patients access to a citrovimab or similar program. So I think the other thing for the GPs to know is where is your closest um, uh, infusion or, uh, you know, unit for, for something like citrovimab. Most of the big um, uh, hospitals in New South Wales are, are able to give it. And I think the same is true. There are hubs in Victoria um, that, that, that will give it. So I think you know, identifying your patients who are at risk. Now, that might be doing a quick screen through your uh, through your data banks of who's on dialysis, who's had chemotherapy for um, for lymphoma this year, who's having breast cancer treatment. You know, you could pretty quickly identify who are your obese, you know, your obese patients, and just mention it to them. You're not completely vaccinated. You're at risk of getting really sick if you do catch COVID. These are the two things we need to do. Get vaccinated. Can I just clarify then, uh, if you're fully vaccinated, but say you've got an immune suppression issue or malignancy in the, you know, recent malignancy or had chemotherapy or whatever, or you're very elderly, are you able to receive these antibodies or is there any data that suggests it might be useful in that setting? Um, do you want to yeah, speak? Look, I can speak to that, but I think James can too. Yeah, yeah. look, I, either of us. Um, look, I think it's worth reminding the audience, as I'm sure they know, that there are there are basically two sorts of immunity, uh, and we can measure we can easily measure one with with antibody levels. Now, that doesn't tell the whole story, but if uh, if your antibody levels are low, and I think it might be an indication for actually measuring antibodies in some of our chronically immunosuppressed patients and knowing what their vaccine response has been like. Um, yes, they should have a third dose, uh, but once again, they may not develop a good response. And I think we will end up moving to giving giving these drugs in that setting. At the moment, the indications uh, uh, are for partially or non-vaccinated uh, uh, patients, but I think that will move. And I think we will also have antibodies available for prophylactic use uh, in the future um, when you're exposed but not uh, not yet positive. I just make the point too that um, that the, the reason that the trials were done in patients who were um, unvaccinated is that at the time it was a clinical trial, you couldn't be on another investigational um, agent. And at the time that the trial was done, all the vaccines were considered under investigation and so they were not uh, so that's the real reason 
that the data would suggest that no bad things happen to people who get citrovimab uh, who have had um, fully, who have been fully vaccinated. Um, and as as, uh, as James mentions, it's likely that in the future, the unvaccinated bit will, will not be the, the rate limiting step. Thank you. Now, another question relates to the concerns about monitoring, because, you know, there were those reports of people rapidly deteriorating in hospital in the home uh, and actually dying at home uh, before they got to hospital or even knew they were supposed to go to hospital. Um, so what about monitoring? You mentioned uh, monitoring, James, very briefly, but, you know, what do you look for? When do you send them to hospital if they're really ill? I know a lot of clinicians are quite worried about this aspect as they perhaps manage this going forward. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's a really important uh, question, Nick, and um, I think patient safety in hospital in the home is is really paramount. Um, risk patients are escalated in terms of the amount of uh, input they get, and I guess uh, you know we've looked after four and a half thousand patients. We've we had one death during this um, during this Delta outbreak, and that death was related to. I guess traditional male psychology of the patient uh, telling us that they were okay when they weren't okay. And Lucy did fantastic work here because she went on uh, she went on the broader media and told people not to not to tough it out and be macho to actually get into hospital. But look, I I, I think inevitably if you treat enough patients, you will lose some at home. Most of the deaths that occurred at home were actually not yet diagnosed or only just diagnosed and they weren't on a service. But I think, you know, many of the hospitals around Sydney have done a fantastic job, and I'm sure in Victoria as well, at, at really monitoring uh, patients at home in a very intense way, particularly if there are risk factors. I think, again, I'd highlight the obesity issues sometimes uh, you know, you need to actively ask for the patient's weight and work out their BMI in order to calculate their risk because that is, if there's one thing, one uh, predisposing factor to death that we have uh, experienced, it's been the obese patients. And so really having your team across bringing those patients into hospital at the earliest signs that they're getting into trouble. The other thing is to watch the timeline of where they're up to in their diagnosis. Now, timelines timelines are never as good as they are in studies. Timelines can be rubbery and you can be on, on day five plus or minus two uh, and I think that's the real world. But I think when you're getting towards the end of the first week, you really need to be, be hypervigilant about patients with risk factors if they're developing symptoms. Thank you. Now, I want to ask about uh, controlled comorbidities and, you know, what's the risk and, 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 and how much increased risk do patients have if they've got a comorbidity that's under control uh, rather than perhaps out of control. So let me, for example, ask about hypertension. If it's well controlled, is that really a comorbidity or a risk for a worse outcome? Do they need to be rushed off to hospital early? Or, you know, I, so I guess people are looking for some guidance around what's really important and what, what perhaps is less relevant in terms of driving uh, bad outcomes and therefore intervening early enough. I can speak to this, James, quickly if you like. I think I think the, the well-controlled hypertension is, is not a major deal. If that's all there is, that's really probably not the major deal. There was a lot of interest early on out of the Wuhan cohorts that um, men with hypertension on one um, antihypertensive agent were the the uh, you know the biggest group who who did really badly. But that has not been our experience in, in Australia with Delta variant. The one the the the, the comorbidities that have made the biggest impact in my experience would be, we've already talked about, it's obesity. Um, and it's the concomitant comorbidities that go with obesity that really um, make a big difference. But even in our young, fit, islander, but very big patients, they've just done really badly. They've had really bad outcomes and it's because of respiratory failure that they've done badly. However, diabetes is a very important comorbidity uh, and does uh, definitely predict for bad things happening. It's probably got something to do with the fact that uh, 
one of the strongest evidence-based treatments is to give dexamethasone, and that really screws with your, with your blood sugars. High blood sugars are very bad for fighting infections and mounting an appropriate immune response, and unstable blood sugars are, really do increase your risk of cardiovascular events while you've got a COVID, a COVID illness. So that's a really big one. Um, I, I think other things like asthma is really probably not a major risk factor if it's well controlled uh, on inhaled corticosteroids. In fact, there's a bit of data to suggest that uh, patients who are well maintained on ICS alone are actually at lower risk of progression to severe disease. There might be some story about the steroids actually um, uh, uh, modifying the respiratory illness. But the big ones for me are obesity and diabetes. Um, and really, obesity and diabetes. What do you think, James? Yeah, no, I agree entirely. Um, you know, HIV is is also interesting because I think uh, we've encountered several HIV patients who who are well managed with their HIV, and it doesn't it doesn't seem to um, um, factor overly. Although, you know, uh, I think it's very different if you're dealing with a an untreated HIV. Um, uh, I think pregnancy is the other group that um, really, uh, really do badly. We, we've and had, social um, disadvantage, as you've mentioned before. I mean, I know that's a global yeah. term, but, you know, if you don't have someone to love you, um, if you don't have someone to love uh, and you don't have somewhere safe to live, um, you were at major risk of doing really badly in our recent experience. Yeah, there, there's certainly a... Um, a socioeconomic uh, aspect to this disease, which is really, really important. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd emphasise that as well. So let me ask you both a, a different question. There's, a, there's more questions to come through, and I hope we can get through them. Let me ask you a different question. This is about the impact of the pandemic on both of you as frontline physicians, frontline clinicians. I mean, a lot of anxious physicians and doctors out there that have been in contact with me saying they're very worried about managing what might be a really very difficult um, pandemic to come. It hasn't, it's maybe not all over. Um, and uh, they're worried about it and they're concerned about themselves and their families and the impact on their, on, on, on everything they do. So any words of wisdom, uh, how's it impacted you and uh, how do you cope? I need to keep it relatively brief because we do want to well, cover some I, other areas. I, I guess there are I guess there are two um, two pandemics that are going on simultaneously. The first one is the anxiety pandemic, and I remember when I um, when I got on the plane to fly to Wuhan uh, back in late January of uh, 2020, I certainly had a fair bit of anxiety about what we were going into because we didn't know. And I think I think lack of knowledge uh, feeds anxiety. Um, but also, you know, our, our fellow clinicians and nursing staff and, um, you know, uh, doctors um, are, are really understandably anxious about this condition. It's not often in our working lives where we face something that can potentially kill us or that we can take home to our families. And so that anxiety needs to be understood and really, really worked through. And I think understanding PPE and understanding that you don't catch this infection if you wear PPE properly. That's really important. And I've seen people go from very anxious state to being very confident with this disease uh, in a short space of time. The second thing to say is when you get a surge like we've just had, everyone works incredibly hard. You're doing 12, 16 hour days. You're on edge all the time, but it it is, it is one of the most satisfying jobs in medicine, you know, saving young lives with infections and turning around people uh, and getting them back uh, back out there is just fantastically satisfying. And a lot of our JMOs really, really enjoyed that experience. Um, but what I think really, um, really helps is where you have a coherent team. So where you've got a team that really... Uh, are talking to each other on the same platform. And like, I don't normally talk to respiratory physicians, but COVID, <laughs> COVID has made me talk to Lucy. <laughs> so Lucy, let me ask you briefly, any, any reflections there? Um, look, this has been without a doubt the most challenging and probably rewarding um, part of my career today. Um, 
I think if I was to pull up my slide of James, uh, of Doctor Who and Rose Tyler um, and the TARDIS, it would remind me to talk about the value of collegiate companionship. And, and, and I'm not a serve, um, uh, you know, I have not served in a military sense. James has had much more experience in that sense than I have. But that idea of we're in the trenches together, of camaraderie, of where, where we are well trained, we know what we're doing, we can make a difference, um, and we're here for each other, we're looking out for each other. Um, you know, that's the sorts of things that get, get, get troops through battles. Um, uh, that's the sort of thing that's kept me going. I haven't had um, I haven't had a holiday for a long time, and I'm looking forward to being able to do that. Um, uh, and, and I know it sounds glib, but remembering um, to kiss the ones you love, um, and to have some time out, and to find some way of making sure you get enough sleep and a bit of exercise, it sounds glib, but that's been very important to me. Thank you. Very, very interesting, very relevant. Let me ask you one very brief question. We haven't got much time to cover it, but I've been asked on the chat about, well, you know, what about these other interventions on the internet? You know, these early interventions that are promulgated on the internet. Uh, you know, what's is there any real evidence to support any of those approaches? We can't cover them all, but I just wanted a general sense. I mean, is there something that's just not being delivered that should be that uh, we're not doing? Well, I think I think we always have to base it in science, and um, you know, I, I'm very open to to ideas. And I I remember, um, you know, really early on, there was a suggestion that vitamin D might be might be uh, good to use in this setting. And I think you have to look at what does no harm. And uh, you know, I'm I'm quite happy if people want to take some vitamin D. Uh, I'm not sure it'll help their COVID. Um, and you know, until studies come out that prove some of these things, uh, I think you need to look at whether they do harm, whether they cost a lot of money. If they don't cost any money and they don't do any harm, it probably doesn't matter. But if they if they cost a lot of money or if they potentially have a toxicity profile like ivermectin, for example, you know, I think you want to be very cautious about using stuff unless there is a good scientific background. Nick, I've looked after several patients who've, whose presentations to hospital were with toxicity from um, um, unproven therapies, um, and that complicated the management uh, enormously. Had patients nebulizing various things, including hydro, um, you know, all sorts of acidic compounds, um, people taking um, uh, horse medicine, um, and, and they've been really sick. Um, poisoned by those therapies um, and so that you know causes harm um, no I, 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 I completely stickers. agree I, I think uh, I think we've all seen this and it's uh, it is it is worrying when harm is potentially being caused Look, I want to um, uh, thank you very much. There are more questions in the chat, but we can't get to them. But there will be a follow-up podcast uh, uh, with uh, the two presenters, uh, and that will uh, provide hopefully some answers to a few more of your questions um, and also an opportunity for the presenters to, uh, to provide a little bit more information uh, where required. Look, I want to thank uh, both uh, James and Lucy for wonderful presentations, for answering the questions so elegantly, uh, and for uh, being part of this this evening, as they are really frontline experts worth listening to. I'd like to thank all of the audience for attending tonight and for your questions, um, and uh, I hope you all have a, a great evening to follow. And uh, thank you again for being part of this event. Good evening. Thanks for having us, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Lucy.